Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on Using Literacy to Turn Around High Schools, Lessons Learned from Sue Zakowitz. I'm Joe Harris. I'm the director of the National High School Center, and I'm pleased to welcome all of you today to this webinar. This, this webinar has come about as a result of the meeting that we held, uh, the Midwest High School SIG meeting uh, or conference in mid-May in Chicago. Many of you requested that we do a follow-up presentation and to allow uh, an opportunity for Sue to share some of the nuts and bolts of how they implemented some of the professional development, and that's what we plan to do during this session. Um, we'll start, Sue, would you, uh, next slide, please? So we'll start with this quick introduction, spend most of our time uh, with Sue doing her presentation. Uh, she's agreed to allow a half an hour at the end of the presentation for folks to be able to uh, ask her questions directly. Uh, and then we'll have some, a few closing remarks about next steps for going forward, uh, if indeed uh, some of you are interested uh, in doing so. Uh, the next slide is a list of the uh, act discusses the access to the resources that will be available online from the high school center. These include everything that Sue shared with us in the uh, um, at the meeting in Chicago, as well as the additional resources, including a recording of this webinar um, as part of that. That'll be posted very early uh, in the next uh, few days. Um, and will be available on that website as well. So when we begin the webinar, you'll have the uh, access, and you should see at the top of your screen, um, a bar that uh, uh, says content, attendees, voice and video. So what you're going to be looking for is the part that says Q&A. Throughout the presentation, you can individually click on that and record a, or type in a question that we will share with Sue at the end of the presentation. After we've shared all the typed in questions, if we still have time, also open up the, um, the phone system for you to ask questions directly for, to Sue and or for her to, for any follow-up questions that you may have or follow-up discussions for some of the questions that we've asked already. So uh, on the next screen, is the title of uh, Sue's presentation, Transforming High School Culture Through Literacy and Professional Development. I would say to you I, uh, a few words to introduce Sue, but for those of you who know Dr. Zach, you know she needs no introduction. <laughs> so I'm just going to say uh, a welcome, everybody. Again, we will uh, have opportunity at the end of the presentation for questions and answer and for more informal discussion. In the meantime, take it away, Sue. Thanks, Joe, and I'm so glad to do this. I've never done a webinar before, uh, so uh, this is cool. And, in fact, at our faculty meeting today, we were doing a big thing on using technology, so um, I guess I'm hopefully all will go well. And I know most everybody heard um, the presentation before, if not everybody, uh, but this hopefully will be a more in-depth one. And um, so let me take you through what's going to happen in the, in the presentation. I'm going to just do a quick review of who we are here in Brockton, Massachusetts at Brockton High School. What we did, which is literacy for all, no exceptions, cross all content areas. How we did it, and I've really sort of tried to detail that in a four step process. And then I'm going to, this is different, the next, the final sections are different than what I did earlier in Chicago because what I, what Joe asked me to do is really go into the how. And I said even at that time, the key to what we did was implementation with tenacity and a plan, and we monitored like crazy. So I'm actually going to take you through two of the literacy workshops we actually did. Now, I'm not going to do them at the exact same. They actually would each take an hour, so I'm going to go through it quickly, but at least you'll have a sense of what, I, what do I mean by a literacy workshop. And then finally... I like to review the results a little bit because, you know what, they're kind of cool and um, it's good news. And, you know, we don't always get the good news in the media in schools. So, a uh, quick review. Brockton High School is the most awesome school in the world. And since you're all muted, no one can dispute that with me. Um, here's our demographics. We are a gigantic, comprehensive high school, 4,261 kids. Um, but actually, we have a big registration even this week, so there's probably going to be over 4,300 4, by the end of the week. 
Uh, we are a very high poverty school in Massachusetts. We're in Massachusetts what they call 70-70 school, which means more than 70% poverty and more than 70% minority, and it's about a 73% minority. Very diverse population. Over 50 different languages are spoken, and more than half of our students speak a language other than English in the home. We have about 12% in transitional bilingual ed, and that, I know that means different things in different states, but here's what it means at Brockton High. It means those are our brand newcomers. And so they are in their first year of arrival, and uh, many of them are um, what we call, we have a special low literacy students with interrupted formal schooling. So some of these uh, students haven't been to school in many, many years. And then we're 11% special education. And the student population, and I'm so glad Joe can, you know, kept some of the photos in the, in the PowerPoint because the best part of all is look at the faces. Uh, we are about 57% black, but that is very diverse as well, African-American, Cape Verdean. Quick word about the Cape Verdean students. Cape Verde is an island nation off the coast of Africa, and um, that's a, a large percentage of our kids. And the reason I highlight that is in Cape Verde, it is not – it's our most challenging population, not because they're Cape Verdean, but rather because of the laws in Cape Verde, which only require a student be educated to the sixth grade. So it's not uncommon for us to have a student who is 17, 18, or 19 years old arrive at the counter to register at Brockton High School, and they haven't been to school for six years. And, uh, and welcome to a high-stakes test that we have. So anyway, we have a very diverse population, about 26% white, 14% Hispanic, and a mix of Asian and a handful of Native American kids. So it's just whatever you look like at Brockton High, somebody else looks like you. Review of where we were. In Massachusetts, the, the, it is a high-stakes test, meaning they must pass English, math, and now science has been added last year. And, in fact, history is on the horizon. In 1998, when MCAS came in, as you can see from this slide, we were failing miserably. Uh, our, in English, language arts, we had a 44% failure rate, and in math, a 75% failure rate. But when you looked at our special education failure rate, it was even, I mean, those failure numbers are alarming, but this is even more alarming. I mean, 98% of the kids failing the math, it was distressing. Equally distressing is, in Massachusetts, there's four categories of MCAS scoring. Advanced is the top, then proficient, then needs improvement, and then failing. A student can earn a diploma by hitting needs improvement, but the schools in Massachusetts can't meet AYP unless you're at the proficient level. So it was imperative for us to not get kids just to pass. We had to break that mentality of just do enough to get by, and rather we had to get them scoring at the proficient level. And as you can see from this slide, we only had 22% proficient in English and 7% proficient plus advanced in math. So we were in trouble. The worst part of life here at Brockton High, though, um, is that we had a very flawed belief system. The, uh, the first principal I worked for used to say repeatedly to the faculty and the students, well, students have a right to fail. So you would not be surprised here to see kids with their heads down on their desks and a teacher might say, pick that up, please, and the kid would say, well, I have a right to fail. So it was um, a pretty negative academic culture here at Brockton High School. Um, and as I mentioned, it is not just about passing, and this is the difference between then and now. It is about passing and being the best you can be. That's how we always say, are you doing the best you can? Are you the best you can be? And so you can see on this slide the comparison. Now, by the way, our new scores just were released yesterday, and I haven't even, we haven't had a chance to share them with the faculty yet, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, I can't release all of it, but it's even better. Um, our English failure rate, which is was in 1998, 44%. Uh, last year was 5%. And in math, it was 75% down to 14. And I will tell you that we lowered both of those um, this past year. And to lower a 5% failure rate with uh, over half of your kids who don't speak English as their first language is really good. And even more exciting is the uh, advanced plus proficient, which is now up to 74% in ELA and 61% in math. And just the same, those have gone up um, significantly this year, too. So it's pretty cool. So um, how did we do this? And that's what everybody keeps asking. And we're often used as a turnaround school. And I probably said this in Chicago, but I would, if you hear anything from me, I, well, you'll hear a lot. But 
it didn't it wasn't easy and it wasn't fast we didn't implement we didn't buy a program and slap it on everybody and say woohoo we passed it's been hard it's been slow and it's been tenacious improvement constant consistent and it's been a challenge and we had to ask ourselves some key questions and i'd ask all of you to do the same in your own if you haven't already we had to look at what we were teaching how are we teaching it but also things like what can we control and what can't we control because for example i do not have extended daytime here at brockton high school we can't we have very strong unions and very clear contracts so but what could we do were we using the time this question was key what resources do we have now that we can use differently i always hear often oh we don't have the time we don't have the time we didn't have any time we didn't have extra time we didn't even have in service time but we did have contractually two faculty meetings a month each that can only be 1 hour and we weren't using them well so that's what i mean about using resources differently and also we used our professional development money differently instead of just sending people off here and there or um whatever committees we started focusing our our own professional development dollars in a different way and the most important question we ask and still ask every day is is this the best we can be so here's our four step process it you know often you hear it's about um you know you must have a mission you must have a mission and i would say to you we didn't have a mission uh well actually we did it was about winning the football trophies but we ha- it was we didn't have a mission of academics it started for us with a team of teachers and so i will say to everyone on this line the key to our success was adult learning we the teachers were had to do things differently so it came from a team our restructuring committee we focused set, step 2 focused on literacy every day every class no exceptions we implemented with a plan we did not leave it to chance and then finally we believe strongly that what gets monitored is what gets done and we monitored this like crazy and I'll share how so what's a restructuring committee our first step well that's our think tank and i know i shared this in chicago but it is a um it is a our think tank group and everything we do goes through that restructuring committee and it's about 30 people and by the way we have about 325 teachers on our faculty 4000 about 4200 kids uh, about 320 teachers um at first the restructuring committee was small it was about 20 of us because it wasn't exactly the popular committee to be on now it is viewed as the power brokers in the school and we probably have over we just we've just closed the applications for this year's committee there's over 80 applicants so we have every department represented with a mix of teachers and administrators it's a balance of new teachers and veterans new voices and and veterans uh, voices of experience um lots of professional strengths in the room and most importantly um it's people that we trust and people that laugh every single day so what is the process though that the restructuring committee uses and i think that might be helpful in as you think about your own school improvement the first step is it's the restructuring committee that targets the literacy skill we're going to focus on we but we look at the data we say um and i'm going to give you an example of one a bit later where we used um our students were not doing well using the visuals of the math and the science the graphs the charts the webs and all of that so we looked at the data and said we need to do some work on that so the restructuring committee sort of serves as the they they look at that we look at the data and the, and we determine where we need to go then comes the challenge we say okay our students need work on reading visuals analyzing visuals so a smaller subgroup of the restructuring committee because it's hard to work with over 30 people to do the detail work so a smaller subgroup drafts a script to train the teachers in how to teach the kids how to do this adult learning we need to learn to do it this way and then we need to teach it to the kids this way and we so we bring the draft to the full committee and we are our own, we really you know we're not we're critical we we're, we're we're very much the critical friends and sometimes not even friends <laughs> just critical we um then roll it out to the faculty finally when we're ready when we revise it and revise it and revise it and the way we do that is the first step we do it in an interdisciplinary way now for those of you that are on at the high school level and have grades i'd cross grades the point being you don't want people with their closest friends in their close communities we purposely and consciously split the groups so that people are thinking cross grade cross discipline 
uh, it, it needs to be about the skill, not about the content. And then finally, we follow up. How do we implement, and we follow up in department, how do we implement in the content area? So what does this mean? It's about literacy for all. And here's what we did. We defined literacy, totally defined literacy, um, and uh, in four areas. And the four areas are reading, writing, speaking, and reasoning. And we focused on that all the time. Now, I'm just going to take a minute to tell you a funny note that my associate principal just passed me. The fire lieutenant came in and said, alarms have to be fixed before parents arrive. So if you suddenly hear a fire alarm go off behind me, I'm trying to delay it till 5 o'clock, but we'll see. Anyway, back to business. Literacy for all, reading, writing, speaking, and reasoning. And we also, in the midst of this, said, well, you know what? We have two goals. These, these literacy objectives are designed to do two things. We must increase student academic achievement, and we must personalize the education for every kid. So let's get back to the literacy. You all have this. Literacy is something everybody agrees to. Yes, yes, we all support literacy. Of course we do. But what does it mean? And I would tell you that, in fact, literacy will probably be defined differently even by everybody on this call. What does it mean to you might be different than what it means to me. And frankly, what we saw at Brockton High School is there, weren't, there was not one consistent definition. And I would ask all of you on the line, if I, asked, if I went to your school and asked your students, what are the most important learning objectives in your school, could they do it? Could they detail that for you? And in Brockton High, they couldn't. Now they can, but at the time, they couldn't. And so you see on the screen our literacy charts, which are in every single classroom, every single room. And But the key is this, so big deal. There's lots of charts and posters in rooms, and there's lots of three-ring binders on principals um, and teachers' uh, bookcases. What we needed to do was bring those to life and make them used in a classroom. But first and foremost, we drafted these literacy skills. We said, okay, Literacy in reading means you have to read for content, and even inferential content. You have to uh, apply pre-reading, during reading, and post-reading strategies. You have to gather information. You have to determine the main idea. In other words, we defined it over and over and over again. And then what we did, though, is engage the faculty, because as you can imagine, and already people are thinking, I'm sure, on this line, well, what would the faculty think about it? Well, let me just tell you straight out. They didn't embrace it. And, you know, we had this in all content areas. So just think of the joy of a physical education teacher when we started saying, but we're going to focus on literacy. There, were lot, there was lots of negativity, and that had to be dealt with. But the one thing we did is communicate frequently and consistently. So we sent these drafts that we had done to the faculty, and he, we engaged the teachers in interdisciplinary discussion groups. So even though they might not have agreed with it, they knew about it. And so it was never imposed from outside. They saw it being worked through. And I, the reason I'm stressing that is I think that was an important part of the process for us, that this was not viewed as, oh, we bought this program and the superintendent wants it, so plop. This was developed, and they saw it as a work in progress. And as I said, it didn't mean they agree with it, but they saw it. So... In each of the four areas, we ask people this question. In each of the four areas, reading, writing, speaking, and reasoning, have we included what's required for students to be successful in your class or content area? In other words, what's missing? What did we miss? Secondly, is the skill stated clearly so that all teachers and students can understand it? And did we say it clearly? Sometimes we don't say things clearly. And finally, is it applicable across all content areas? Those were huge questions. Uh, focus, and I love, if you haven't taken a look at this, um, I love this book uh, that Mike Schmoker just put out called Focus because I read the book and then I said, oh, my goodness, that's exactly what we did. And and he makes three points, and that's, those are the three that we did. That to improve schools, you have a focus on good curriculum, the what we teach, effective instruction, how we teach it, and especially authentic literacy, which is the spine that holds everything together. And that was huge for us. So cool, we have these charts on the wall, so what? 
and, and we're very good at saying to ourselves, so what? Now, the key to our implementation is how we then train the teachers to teach these literacy skills to the students. So let me go back to something I've said a couple of times. The key to our success has been not the students, the adult learning. We needed to teach each other how to do things differently. Now, we had those four areas, reading, writing, speaking, and reasoning. Well, clearly, we couldn't do it all. We would have driven every, we were already driving people crazy, but we would have driven them extra crazy if we tried to do it all. And we started with writing. And the reason we started with writing is we believe writing is thinking. If kids can articulate their thoughts clearly in writing, they're being, they're going to be more successful. And secondly, we wanted something measurable. And we could train people to do writing. They should be writing in every class. We could measure it. We created our professional development scripts. How are we going to teach the teachers at Brockton High School to teach writing? And everybody's going to do it the same way. And follow the journey of the kid. You know, it shouldn't be that the kid goes to period one and, and gets an essay format this way and then goes to his next class and the teacher says, oh, I want you to use this essay format. And the next class, it's this one. And frequently, I'm sorry to say, in many schools, and certainly for us anyway, I'm not judging anyone else's, but in our school, it was based on what the teacher standards were. We didn't have a school mission like that. So we trained all our faculty in what the process would be. And I'm going to talk more about this next one in a second. Implement it according to a calendar because that was huge. So let me talk about the, 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 the literacy workshops and know that I'm going to come back to this calendar thing because the calendar piece was huge. We turned our faculty meetings, which were frankly uh, not well used. An administrator would stand up and make some announcements <laughs> about fire drills, which I may face in a minute here. Um, and instead we made them literacy workshops. And by the way, that was no small change, calling them literacy workshops. Because a faculty meeting meant you came late, you sat in the back of the room, you corrected a few papers, grumbled about being there, and tried to get out as fast as you could. A literacy workshop implies professional development. So I would urge you to use something that is what you, what are you accomplishing, that's what it should be called. And so our success was in the adult learning. So here was our model. We developed a training script. We trained ourselves, here's how we're all going to do this. We then trained the faculty. Remember, we only had two meetings a month to do this, one hour each. So the first one was in an interdisciplinary format. So we mixed teachers up, so we had teachers in small groups of maybe 15 or 20, and we trained them in how to do it. And then the next meeting, we said, okay, you've already been trained once, let's review it, and then talk about how we do that in your department. So if you're crossing grades, it could be grade level, how, or clusters, however you want to set it up. We implemented according to a calendar, which I'm going to come back to, assessed using a rubric, monitored and collected student work frequently. Now let me talk about this calendar thing, because this is huge. This was one of the, I think, this was the key to our success. Oftentimes, implementation is left to chance. Oh, yeah, I did that. We figured if we trained everybody on writing on one Thursday, on Friday, everybody on earth would do the assignment, so the kids would get whacked with writing and then never get it again. And teachers would say, I already did this. And what we believed is kids learn things by practice, practice, practice. Not just kids, all of us. So as you can see from this calendar, we assigned by department a week that they should do the writing assignment. Use your own content. So if you're a social studies teacher that week of, of, of November 2nd to 6th and you're teaching uh, the American Revolution, then that's, um, you do that writing assignment using that content. And then you see we wait a couple weeks and go to wellness and JROTC, wait a couple weeks more, and when you follow the journey of the child, you see that that student has gotten that assignment, different content, but same standards, about ten times in the course of the year. Did they learn it? You bet. And the other reason it worked well, so the most important reason we used the calendar was for the practice for the student. The second reason we did it, though, was to monitor it well, because we needed to see how it was going in those classrooms. And we can't possibly be all over this giant school, but we surely can focus on one department at a time. So whether it's a department or a grade level, it doesn't matter. And this sort of sums up what we believe about this, is that we say this all the time. We love this quote by Aristotle. Practice makes proficient. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act but a habit. So how did we monitor? We believe what gets monitored is what gets done. 
And we used um, rubrics, which I shared. We both are actually online and up. We used, and you probably all have rubrics anyway, and we, we didn't. We didn't even know what a rubric was at first. We were so far behind. But a standard measure, because the A shouldn't be different depending on what a class a student is in. We implemented according to a calendar, so we monitored when teachers were doing it, and we, the admin team, observed that implementation. We require teachers to use a literacy objective every day in their lesson plans, which are reviewed by us. We conduct walkthroughs, which are more informal observations, of course, and then we collect and review student work frequently. Now, we, uh, this is just quick. We, we used, this was our example of an open response rubric, which you're welcome to look at. You probably all have good ones, and, but this is what I mean by the rubric. It's really on, co we were always respectful of content, and so you can see that kids must know, it can't be just well written and say nothing. They really na need to say something. And for example, they better respond to the question. They better demonstrate the evidence. I mean, that, it's really a powerful rubric, I think. How did we assess this? Um, the faculty had to assess, assess the student's writing based on the rubric. The department heads then collected uh, the copies of the student work and looked for consistency across their department. After a couple of weeks, the department had had a chance to review everything. The department then had to had had to collect the, uh, turn the work into the associate principal, and then we had discussions about consistency across not just department departments but also across the school and so that our assessment standards were rigorous and consistent. We also put in place portfolios for students with IEPs and English language learners because we realized lessons learned the hard way that we had to monitor that at a much higher level. Let me show you what I mean by some of this. In reading, for example, here's our literacy chart. So we say you need to read for content, apply free reading and post reading strategies, etc. You can you can read that. But we also had to teach teachers how. Let me use myself as a bad example. I was a history teacher. I wasn't opposed to teaching reading. I just didn't know how to teach reading. I just, here's how I taught reading. I might give my students a primary source document, and then I would say, um, you know, and they'd look at me in something from the Federalist Papers that a 15-year-old just loves to read, and they would say, uh, Dr. Zach, I don't get this. And so here's how I taught reading. Well, then read it again. So I think most teachers would be like me. It's not that you're against it. You don't know how. So we taught the teachers how to teach reading in the content area, and we really got some help. We used Tavani's I read it, but I don't get it, and do I really have to teach reading? There's great strategies in there. And we developed our own school-wide profile of what active reading strategy should be. So you don't go to one class and say, use a highlighter, and go to another class and underline, and use, go to another class and circle. We, you don't do that. Instead, at Brockton High, everybody does it this way. We've really struggled with speaking, and there's no speaking component on measurement on MCAS, but we believed that we couldn't stand how they spoke, actually. And so we developed one. So it's not just about a test. It's about good education. And so you can see our speaking skills rubric, and we want kids to convey their thinking in complete sentences, in sentences debate issues, participate in class discussions. And sure enough, um, we did a literacy training. Now, here's the first one I'm going to show you. Now, this would take an hour, so I'm just going to run through it. But this, by putting it in the PowerPoint like this, you then have it. You can see how real this is. I, you can see the date we did this. This is an example of our literacy training. What we wanted to do is train the teachers in some strategies on how to get the kids to participate in class. But we model what we want teachers to do. So we begin with an agenda. Here's what you're going to do today. Complete the warm-up sheet on obstacles to participation. Have a small group discussion. Create a chart. Discuss the rubric. This is what the teachers are going to do, but it's also what we hope they then teach the students to do. We also want to model good instruction, so we present our goals, and here are our goals for this training. Teachers will be able to implement class discussions. We're going, to tr we're going to do this by teaching them three different class discussion strategies, how to do a four corners discussion, how to do an in outer circle discussion, and how to do a full class discussion. And then lastly, how to use the rubric. Now, of course, you want to warm up in your class, so here's, I'm not going to go through all these because for time purposes, but you don't need to go through all these, but this is what we asked teachers to do. We gave them warm-up questions. But you can see, look at the topic we have them talking about. 
the struggles on getting kids to participate in class discussion. So in other words, we're training them in discussion strategies, but we're having them talk about the struggles they face with kids having discussions. The first one we did was what criteria do you use for grading full class discussions? And how would you grade a four corners activity? How would you grade in or out of circle? How would you grade full class discussion? So, I mean, I think you get the picture. What we try to do is train people in strategies. Not all of our teachers come to us uh, with a ton of – some do. Some are very well prepared. Um, but we're always interested in getting more of them. And then the final piece of this was the oral presentation rubric. That was not the full speaking skills training, but I just wanted you to see what I meant of how we – adult learning, adult learning – we train the teachers to do what we need them to do and, and what they need to do to help the kids. And here's our rubric on this one happens to be on speaking skills, which actually the students helped us develop. And a big area of focus for us has been reasoning because this is the critical thinking skills that our kids are our students are really struggling with these. Probably yours are too. Analyzing, inference. I mean, it's tough stuff. And um, so we're still struggling with this. And this is um, this is our reasoning chart, which is really we purposely called it reasoning instead of critical thinking because we thought reasoning sounded more active. And so you can see what that is. Now, this one is really cool. This is one of our best ones ever. And I put the whole thing in. And I'm just going to say now Joe tried to cut it, and I wouldn't let him because you need to see the whole thing. I'm, again, I'm not going to take – obviously, I'm going to go through this quickly. But we, the restructuring committee, noticed in our data that our students are struggling with reading and analyzing visuals. The, all over the Massachusetts test, all over SAT, ACT, there's graphs, charts, webs, flow charts, scatter plots, all of those things. And we were noticing that our kids were skipping them, leaving them, not doing what they needed to do. So we trained, and you can see when we did it, we just did this one recently, last April, we train the faculty in how to teach the kids to read and analyze visuals. So this is the actual script that we train the teachers in. As always, modeling a good lesson. Here are our objectives, objectives for the, the um, reading visuals workshop. We want you to gather information and understand the concept of reading from meaning, the meaning from the visual. Reason to interpret and explain tables, charts, or graphs. It connects to the work we've done. And here's our agenda for this workshop. We always begin with an opener. We're then going to do the presentation. We're going to practice this five-step process that we developed, have discussion and feedback, and we always have a closer, just the way you'd want to run a class. Um, we had them, I'm not going to go through this, but this is some data that was done on us by Professor Ron Ferguson from Harvard, and we had the teachers analyze this data as the opener because um, we like the data and it says good things about us, but that's why we used it. What did that data tell us? We actually had them go through some, um, this, this is some uh, information that they might have pulled from that. How does this work connect with what we're doing? Well, we want, we want to have a rationale. Why are we asking teachers to do this with kids? Well, we, openness and closes aligns with types of questions. I mean, the uh, visuals aligns with the type of questions students have to answer on M MCAS, PSAT, SAT, ACT. And the problems that we see in visuals usually have a student has to identify some knowledge, they have to answer a couple of questions that build on that knowledge, and then they have to have a question that re answer a question that requires synthesis or evaluation. Then we put the teachers through the process. We actually had them go through analyzing a visual. So they went through what their students have to go through. And we purposely picked one that was complicated and that most teachers wouldn't know. And you can see it. And feel free to go through it later on your own time, but I'm going to move through it for now because it's about all of these biology things. Then we said, <laughs> excuse me, the process of reading a visual begins with understanding and analyzing the information before they answer the question because we noticed that our kids were racing right to get an answer. So we train them using an example and how to take what's in the information. There's introductory information, there's a title, there's a key, there's labels, correlations. And we, the restructuring committee, developed this five-step process that the teachers now train the kids in. When you see a visual, you need to first identify the type. Secondly, determine the topic. Thirdly, examine the information. Fourth, develop predictions. Fifth, analyze the questions. That's all before you even answer the question. 
Now we put the, we had the teachers practice. I'm going to skip this section because I'm sure you'd all like to be sitting on this webinar figuring out about this, uh, this math data on the employees at company T and Q. So I'll skip over this. But the point that you should see from this is when we train the teachers, we train them by modeling what they should be doing with the students. We even share here's what your know, responses might be. Here's what some predictions might be. Let's apply these five steps. Remember, you always have to apply the five steps. Now, we asked the teachers to do the same thing. We got them in groups, gave them a visual, had them go through it, select a speaker to report out, and report their findings. We again reviewed the, four, the five steps. Here's the problem we had them do, and it's, with a, a, uh, it's a pedigree diagram, actually, and so we had them go through that one. And then we said, okay, where are we going with this? Well, in May, we're going to use this at the department level. We're going to help the kids go through this, and our hope is that we improve student achievement on the science and MCAS score, a science and math MCAS. And then, of course, as a good lesson, you always have a good closer. We did a think pair share on reading visuals. How do you how, describe how the steps for reading visuals will help your students improve their reading and reasoning skills? I thought it was pretty cool. So you can see from this, we've done literacy workshops in all kinds of areas open response writing, Tavani's reading, question analysis, summarizing, previewing a text, using visuals to preview a text, teaching the text last, vocab in, con in context, problem solving, thinking routines, and on and on and on. You can see them all on the screen. Over the years, we've done different ones, and the focus is really based on what we see in the data. But we always keep reviewing them because this is just good practice every day supporting the literacy initiative. Here's the result. It changed attitudes in the school. Instead of just having the English teachers and the math teachers responsible for the MCAS, which is what it used to be, people used to see those crummy scores and they say, well, thank God I don't teach that subject, um, that everybody needs to be responsible for every kid. And I love that we, you know, we, it's funny because my associate principal and I laugh all the time because we always quote other people, and so we decided to quote ourselves. <laughs> so the experts say, and I, but I believe this, Making change in a school is not about brilliance, and it's not about it's about tenacity. We kept going at it, kept going at it, and didn't give up. And so, on that note, that sort of wraps up where we are and what we did. And I'll turn it back over to Joe to say um, where do we go from here and whatever questions people have. So, Sue, thanks so much. Um, we're gonna before we open it up to most folks. I'm going to ask you a couple questions uh, that. Uh, there are kind of burning questions that I've had about about this work uh, since uh, your presentation. First one being, uh, could you take a moment to explain how the activities differ year by year uh, in terms of the professional development uh, workshops that are offered and the activities that the, then the, like the, the schedule of implementation, uh, how do they differ over the course of uh, three or four years? And they do. Um, although there are some things that are never different, Joe. For example, there's always a focus on reading and writing and analyzing reading because uh, active reading because that's done every day. But in terms of focusing what workshop, for example, using the reading visuals as an example, that's new. And the reason we started focusing on that is we get better looking at our own data and saying we need to provide the teachers with tools to help the kids be successful. So the, the focus for us comes from what the data tell us, and, um, and not just MCAS. I, I mean, we do it on, by, we do our own benchmarking, we have teacher reports. So when we see something that we need to focus on, then we try to develop a workshop on it. So uh, then taking that from the perspective of a student, over the course of the four years that I would be at Brockton as a student, what would I see differently in terms of what I, in terms of the four different areas that you focus on? Uh, would, would, it, would it appear redundant in some cases, or is there new stuff happening all the time throughout my four years? Uh, actually, both, yes to both new stuff and redundancy, because the redundancy I don't see as a negative. It's reminding kids about good reading and writing and speaking and reasoning practice. But you're absolutely right. It builds in complexity each year. For example, the freshmen coming in now, we have a very transient population, so we have kids in and out all the time. So we're always having to get kids up to speed um, and teachers up to speed when we have new teachers. And so um, 
we, we do a freshman introductory literacy unit around what it means at Brockton High, reading, writing, speaking, and reasoning. So it is very different that they get, they're sort of getting a beginning. By the time the kids are, have moved in, by the time they're juniors, they are much more into the complexity of all of the really higher level inferential analytical um, literacy skills. Some of them are because they are still newcomers, they're still getting a handle on English. There might be all kinds of reasons that, that um, kids are at all different spots, but it is a focus that we have that every year they're still getting all four of those skills. But I would say to you that the activities they're doing are not redundant in that it's the content provides the context. So they may be writing in the same format, but they're writing about all different things, learning about all kinds of things. Same thing with what we're focusing on this year. We're about to kick off a, a workshop on nonfiction analysis because the Common Core has a, the, the Massachusetts frameworks and MCAS used to have mostly a literary basis. So kids would get Shakespeare, poetry, all of that stuff. Um, that's fine. But the Common Core is much more heavily nonfiction based. And um, so we're going to really try to help the kids plow through some nonfiction stuff. So we're working on that now. Great. So you mentioned uh, student mobility, but you also have talked throughout the importance of investing uh, time and energy in the teachers and their professional development and adult learning. But we also know that there's also a turnover of teachers throughout, especially a school the size of Brockton where you've mentioned there's over 300 faculty members. Right. I'm sure there's a significant turnover every year. Right. Um, so how do you address that issue of of providing, the, investing in this professional development uh, and yet dealing with the potential for teacher turnover and some people coming in uh, somewhere in the middle of a, a cycle of uh, instruction that's going on. Right. And we have to because it doesn't help a student if someone is just, oh, well, I'm new, so I don't know. So we actually do leave people alone for the first couple of weeks of school. We actually welcome 23 new teachers here this year, as a matter of fact. And, and in fact, five of them are former graduates of Brockton High, which is pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, um, we, uh, we will start in next week, actually, training the teachers who are new in these literacy workshops. Now, unfortunately, because we have such a strong contract and union, we can't ask them to stay after school. We can't ask them to do extra time. So the way we have to do this, and I don't like doing it, but we have to, our teachers um, are required by contract to do an administrative duty period every day, like they're monitoring the lunchroom or in the car is, because we're such a big, huge complex. So what we have to do, we can't ask them to use their prep time either. They do get one prep period each day, and they, we can't use that, uh, even though you might think that's prep, but not contractually, that's their time. So what we have to do is pull the teachers out of their duty period and then do the training for them. So it's difficult to do because um, we, instead of putting, the best thing to do, Joe, be able to put them all together in, at one time, unfortunately we have to work it around different periods of the day. So it gets difficult. But we do it because it's essential that they learn they have these literacy workshops now. Okay, great. So I have a question from Brandy who wants to know who was responsible for developing the professional development lessons for teachers. The restructuring committee. It's all talked out by the restructuring committee. And what happens is we, the, as the full committee, will say, we really need to focus on reading visuals. Then a subcommittee of about five of the restructuring committee will then, the subcommittee will focus on developing the script and then bring it back to the full committee. So how does the restructuring committee take all that extra time if they have the same requirements in terms of union contracts and their availability of time. How do they how do they get together to do this work? Oh, good question. I should have mentioned this before. The restructuring committee is a paid committee and remember early on I said we used our professional development monies differently. Um, it's a paid committee uh, and it's done by using our regular professional development funds. You know, in Massachusetts you get it per pupil, you know, you get so many dollars depending on the pupil number of students you have. And so what we do is um, our superintendent puts aside a pot of money instead of doling it all back to the schools and calls it challenge for change money. And that funds our restructuring committee. And we meet on Saturdays. Not every Saturday because we're not insane, but at least once a month, but sometimes more if we're in the middle of doing something. 
and we really work through, um, and they're paid, and so it's a contractual hourly rate. And then um, if we need to do more, we, you know, sometimes we meet during the week, but we purposely don't like to do the after-school meetings because everybody knows it's so hard to get people together after school. People go, I have to pick up my kid at soccer, I have to go here, a kid's waiting for a test. And the Saturday mornings have worked well because people come, they're relaxed, we have, we, we always bring goodies and Danish and stuff, and then um, we get down to work, and we meet from 8 to 12. And it's at least once a, once a month, sometimes more. Okay. So I have a series of questions by Valerie Nyberg that I'm going to ask a couple, of, and then I'll ask a few more after you answer the first part. Okay. Before you do, I just want to tell you again that the fire lieutenant is pacing around outside my office. Um, I, think, I think we could be done by about 4.30 if that's any help. It might be um, because um, if I can hold him off, um, that would be awesome. Because and the only reason we have a we have an open house tonight, so they're trying sure. to make sure the fire alarms are. And, and we certainly don't want to get in the way of a fire marshal. Right, well, we lose anyway. He comes in and just pulls the thing, so I I, I don't have any control over that. Okay. So <laughs> what Valerie was wondering about as you spoke is what were what are what are the demographics of your teachers? Um, well, our demographics of our teachers most certainly do not represent the demographics of our students. Um, our teachers are heavily white. Um, they range in age from, um, you know, from old people like me uh, to uh, brand new babies coming right out of college, 21 years old. So it's quite a mix. I would say to you that we maybe have, um, I would say about 35 of our 300 are uh, probably 25 years or more. Um, I would say the bulk of our teachers are in the um, 30 to 40 range, and then lots of new people. We we probably have more than half of our people that are young. Well, it's a mix. That was not the case, by the way, when we started. Um, when we started all this, um, there had been uh, not a lot of hiring of teachers. In fact, the, the, it was one of the most difficult things because we had mostly a very veteran staff who were counting days sometimes to retirement. So did they or what background did any of them have in working with diverse populations or did they receive all of that, has all of their experience come from their work at Brockton? Yeah, it's really mostly that, Joe. Um, we did, we do try to use the area, I mean, we're in Massachusetts, there's a lot of colleges around, and we do try, some of them have urban education prep programs. The struggle we face in Brockton is we are not tied to, we're about 30 miles outside of Boston. Boston is far more desirable for young teachers to be in because it's the city they want to be in, and Boston outpays us significantly. So we often lose many, um, many, many. Those who want urban education will often stay right in the city of Boston. So we struggle with that. And, um, you know, and so I would say most people, BC, for example, Boston College has a, a urban education program. A number of them do, but, you know, it's, it's hard to get people to come here. So what did you do in terms of talking about race, particularly as you encountered negative perceptions about student ability and success? Oh, my goodness, we sure did. Um, and I, Well, I think the only way, I don't think talk works, frankly. I think results work. So I think you can talk till you're purple about um, what people's expectations are, but I think the only way people really believe is when they see the results. So we actually didn't attack race as, um, as the issue. Uh, what we attacked was literacy. And interestingly, it was the student success that so convinced people when we got the huge improvement in scores by focusing on, at first, the writing and reading, um, all of a sudden, people, uh, you know, I, this is what I'm a real believer in. We didn't wait for buy-in, Joe, because if we waited for buy-in, we'd still be waiting. And you're not going to convince people till they till they see it work. I think most people are cautious. They're going to be like, well, maybe. Some people are just negative. But then there's others who are sort of in a, well, I'm not sure this is going to work, but I'll do it. And then the, it's the results. And, and I can tell you very directly when we got buy-in is that first year we had done the writing and people were crabbing about it. I mean, it was not a happy atmosphere. And we kept going ahead trying to keep a happy little face on and at the end of the year, well, actually, we didn't get the scores till the following opening of school. And we were nervous on the restructuring committee because we had no idea if it was going to work or not. We thought we were on to something, but we weren't sure. 
And so until we got the scores, and when we got the scores and we got a call from the Commissioner of Education saying, you are the most improved school in the Commonwealth, and I am coming to your school to tell your, your students and your faculty, that's when we had buy-in. Now, that ties to the race issue because most of our students are students of color, and we have almost totally closed the racial achievement gap here. And, and here's what I mean by I would refer anybody that doubts that to go to the Achievement Gap Institute at Harvard and look at the research that Ron Ferguson, uh, Professor Ronald Ferguson, who wrote Toward Excellence with Equity, did on our school. Because um, between the 8th grade, when we get the kids, to the 10th grade, when they take the test, we almost totally closed the racial gap. And that's his statistics, not mine. So literacy, to me, is the key. Great. So a question from uh, Brandy Stubblefield is how many periods are in your school day? Um, we have a five-period day of 66-minute periods. However, you know, trying to explain a, a school schedule by phone is just brutal. But um, one of those periods is almost two hours long because it includes lunch. Trying to feed 4,200 kids is like the challenge of the century. So there, within that block of time, it includes student lunch periods. But essentially, the classes are 66 minutes long. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are the written questions that we've received so far, but we do want to take a moment to open the, the phones up to see if anybody has a particular question you'd like to ask directly uh, to Sue or if you have any comments. And in order to do that, you need to press the star key or the asterisk key and then uh, the number seven, and that should open your phone up. So let's take a moment now to see if there are any questions from anyone who's listening in on the, the presentation right now. Well, either, e either uh, Sue, you've done... Uh, either <laughs> I just answered everything anyone could possibly imagine. <laughs> no, I think what's, it's yet again, as we experienced at our, our meeting in Chicago, you've left everybody speechless. Oh, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I think people here would often wish that I was speechless, but that's okay. So a couple other things. For those of you that, let's see, I think it might be the next slide where your information is on. Or, there we go. Oh, yep. I'm sorry, we got another... Question? Um, oh, okay. So, uh, Brandy has another question. Uh, based on your five period day, how many credits do your students need to graduate? See, it, it, I, it's hard to explain that because credits are so internal. Um, we have a very traditional requirement, is probably the easiest way for me to explain that. They need, rather than me say, they need 95 credits, but that's not going to make any sense until I tell you how much each course is worth. Here's probably the easiest way to explain it. They need four years of English, three years of math, three years of science, three years of history, um, you know, phys ed, wellness, all of that, you know. So it's a pretty traditional um, state requirement for what students must pass. And then, of course, in Massachusetts, as, as well as that, you must pass the MCAS. No exceptions on that. No exceptions on passing the MCAS. Great. So um, I think we can, uh, if you'll, for anybody who wants to ask Sue any questions directly, uh, wait, we got another question? Or and I'll tell you what, Valerie, why don't you unmute your phone and, and ask your follow-up question? Valerie Hello? Nyberg? Hello. Hi. Hi, I was just wondering, you had said that um, when you first started this process, you had a lot of veteran teachers and that right. hiring was low. And I wanted to know, at what point did that turnover start to, to, did you start to notice teachers leaving? Did they leave because they didn't like the changes or did they leave because of retirement? And if so, in what percentages? I can't really answer the percentages because we weren't thinking about it in those terms. There's so many things where I wish I had logged it, you know, and, and sort of done that, but I, I guess I can summarize it this way. Um, it was the results that started changing the culture of the school. I, I really believe that. I, like I said, I think you can talk to your purple. It doesn't matter until people see the results, and then they feel good. They know that their work is making a difference. But I would say this. Um, there were some, I would say maybe about a dozen, who absolutely left. And we had, and some we, we made leave. I mean, there are, they're behind closed doors. There were some fierce conversations when people said, I'm not an English teacher, I'm a scientist. And to which, no, you're not. You're a high school biology teacher and you're going to do this. So we had some of those battles behind closed doors, as you can imagine. 
But that wasn't the case for most people. Most people were just, I don't know about this, and they were more cautious. Um, I would say the bulk of people left because they, you know, it sort of it took retirement. I mean, when they when they hit the retirement age, they um, they left. So um, I would say it wasn't really that kind of turn. I think that the people that were here stayed here and made it happen, and even the negative ones. Okay, so um, Brand Thank Brandy. You. Brandy Stubblefield, do you want to ask your follow-up question? Um, press star seven. Okay, Brandy may not have access to a. Are you there? Okay, great. Okay, we were just wanting to know: um, Do you track your students in any way, ability-wise? I I couldn't hear what you said. I'm so sorry. Uh, we were wondering if you track your students anyway as far as ability. Oh, thank you. Yep, now I got it. Um, uh, we do have um, we do have on some classes that are like kids can take classes at the honors level, but not anything else. Everything else is college prep. We started. We never used to be that way. By the way, I would tell you that when all this started, we had very clear tracks, and teachers could actually tell you, "Oh no, Brandy is not really an advanced student; she's an honors level student." Oh, Brandy is really a standard level student who's not a basic level. It's it was awfully it was tracked horribly, and it was about five years ago um, that we also eliminated the tracks. But we weren't ready to do that at the beginning. We I think I think a good lesson from us is step by step. And don't try to do too much at one time. Focus, focus, focus. We didn't change the levels till we were ready. And then when we did, there was no fighting about it. People said, yes, our mission is to get kids ready for college. And we say every day, we ask every teacher to say in every class every day, when you go to college. And that way kids are getting the message. Now, do all of them go? Of course not, but most of them do. Okay. Great. So are there any other follow-up questions, any new questions that anybody would like to ask? Um, I do want to say that the, one of the beautiful things about Sue, even though she's Hello, perfect. Sue? Oh, yes, go ahead. All right, this is Aaron Butler. Uh, I had a question about the implementation calendars. Uh -huh. with the, the, the workshops that you did, did you just focus on just one of the workshops and do it in all of the courses for a year, or did you do maybe – during the year? That's a great question, Aaron. The first year, we only did one. And I'd advise that because people were nervous, they were uncomfortable, they were like, I've never done this before. And we, the first year, we only did writing. Writing, 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 writing. The second year, we did writing with reading strategies as well and vocabulary. Now, because it is the culture of the school, we do lots of different things at different times. But I think what's so essential about the question you asked is, yeah, I would say to you, if you're starting something new, just start with one thing. Because otherwise, I mean, we had so many needs. You know, we actually probably should have started with math because our math scores were so bad. But the bottom line truth of the matter is we couldn't figure it out ourselves. So we started with writing. And that's what we did, just writing that first year. And then maybe look to add one every year. Right. Building it, starting with one. Okay. Exactly, and we constantly build on the previous, and we're always referring back to the other ones, too. Okay, All right. thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, as I said earlier, one of the beautiful things about Sue is she's always running 90 miles an hour, as you can imagine. <laughs> if, if, uh, I frequently talk to her while she's at a football game or on her way to a volleyball That's game. That's right. <laughs> But she does return emails. They Always. Come, they come at strange hours. So I do <laughs> want to encourage any of you that have, specific, on her behalf, I'm going to encourage any of you that have specific questions uh, that are follow-up to these presentation, the presentation today or as you're reviewing the materials, uh, her, her contact information, I would recommend email. That's right. I agree. Uh, so uh, if you have some questions, she will respond directly. Yep. I, al I also want to take a moment to, to remind everybody that the uh, information that she shared and the workshops that she's talked about, the, the, not only are the slides embedded in, this, in, our, in our own uh, PowerPoint presentation, but the original PowerPoint training slides are on our website. They're located at www.betterhighschools.org slash webinar. That's the place where we 
uh, put everything from the previous work, uh, presentation. That's also the place where we will be placing this presentation and the audio portion and the, the recorded portion of that as well. Um, we also want to uh, – could you go ahead and uh, turn the slide for a second? Oh, sorry. Yep. Keep going. Um, no, that's good. So that's the information at the bottom of the screen. Also wanted to remind everybody of two things. First of all, for those of you that registered online using the, the software, um, we, will, uh, we will be sending to you shortly, sometime tomorrow, um, an evaluation of the workshop. And then secondly, um, we will also be sharing with you an interest survey that we'd like to know if you want to continue to have these kind of conversations. Um, uh, we'll try to get Sue back, but uh, if, we want, if you are interested in con uh, continuing conversations around literacy uh, at the high school level, um, then we'd be glad to continue and possibly develop a community of practice uh, around that topic area. I'm sure Sue could recommend to us some of the other assistant principals oh, in, yeah. her, in her school as well. I do also, uh, for those that are curious about faculty reactions, would encourage you to look at the videos that are on the website I mentioned a minute ago, um, one, uh, one's done by PBS, one's done by a local uh, television station, they include comments from some of the teachers and very frank comments about some of them saying that they were naysayers and non-believers till they saw the transformation that Sue has described so eloquently. Um, there is, we recognize that there are a group of you that may, may have chosen not to or may have had difficulties uh, signing on to the webinar through the, through the website and uh, therefore may have just used the copy and followed along uh, using uh, just listening on the conference call. For those of you that have done that, we ask that you send us an email to, uh, to uh, contact us at the bottom bu uh, bullet at help for better high at betterhighschools.org so that we can have your email address on file and we can send you the evaluation. I do want to encourage you to fill out both the evaluation and the interest survey because that's how we uh, um, justify to the Department of Education who provides the funding for these uh, for the high school center, the continuation of these types of activities. So you can help us make the case for doing more of this kind of, of uh, webinars and professional learning community activities by, get, by providing your email address and by filling out the survey indicating that you thought that this was a worthwhile activity. Um, before we close for the day, I just want to again, uh, next slide, Sue, please. Oops, sorry, yep. <laughs> um, Remind those of you that also want to follow us on Twitter or check our, out our blog or Facebook, those are the contact information. All of this information is embedded in the PDF file that you received as part of your information. There's also an excellent article that Sue has authored uh, for a publication by NASSP um, that you may want to look at as well. Uh, again, before we sign off completely, I do want to uh, see if anybody um, has any final questions or comments to Sue. Again, unmute your phone by pressing star 7 if you want to speak. Okay, so on behalf of the National High School Center and all the participants in this webinar, Sue, I want to again thank you. I know uh, you as many of our high school colleagues are actively uh, involved, and I know that's back to school night tonight. Yep, it's open house. Of everything that's going on, and it's a very busy time of year for you, and yet you did take the time, and we certainly appreciate it, and uh, um, hope to be able to engage you again in the future in, in more of these kinds of activities. Thank you to all of our participants who indeed also took the time to participate, and please tell your colleagues about the presentation and about the audio portion of the presentation so that they can uh, take advantage of sharing some of uh, Sue's wisdom as well. Um, again, thank you, and we look forward to seeing you on future presentations. Sue, nothing we can say beyond y you hit another home run. My pleasure. Thanks. i gotta, I got to run, sign off right now, though, so I can go out and pull fire alarms. <laughs> thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye, Joe. And thanks, everybody.
everybody, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Take care.